In Thebes lived an alchemist named Phorneus, much praised for his genius. In time, he would be feared by all. Two matters consumed Phorneus, and he spent his life in their pursuit. The first was how to wake the dead and control them as his army. The second was the creation of a singular, perfect being. The senators sent forth messengers to Phorneus. None returned. Next, the council dispatched soldiers, and still, none returned. Thus, the council chose to seal Phorneus' workshop with him inside it. The seal they used was meant to last until the city crumbled to sand, for here lies the sealed workshop of the demon alchemist, Phorneus. Fire Emblem Awakening receives a lot of flack, even from those like myself who claim to love the game, and a big part of it is Awakening's half-baked and underdeveloped story. I really believe there is not only a good, but a great story hidden somewhere within Awakening, and Act 6 of Fire Emblem Echoes Shadows of Valentia confirms my suspicions perfectly. When these two games are considered together, it weaves a tale of a legitimately intriguing and subtly excellent villain. So today, let's take the time and examine a villain that was once unremarkable and seemed forced, but evolved into something much darker. When Fire Emblem Awakening came out, the biggest question among the side of the community that wasn't concerned with the game's other features was the discussion of Grima. Grima was an odd duck and an enigma, a completely new entity separate from anything we had seen before in Fire Emblem and seemingly much more powerful. Forum discussions raged. Was Grima some alternate form of Medeus, connected to Duma or the Demon King, or was he something else entirely? An answer that seemed to come up a lot was Loptir. Loptair being a dark dragon from Genealogy of the Holy War who shared almost perfect parallels to Grima, the dedicated cult, the dark bloodline, and thanks to the final boss of Thorissa 776, a possible origin in Arcanea. Many, including myself, subscribed to this theory and believed it to help give Awakening a much deeper and much more complex lore. But it's a shame that we put all of our eggs in that basket too soon. Act 6 of Echoes gives us some much-needed answers in the form of Thabes Labyrinth, a large capital buried beneath the sands of what would eventually become Pelagia in Awakening. It is here that we learn of the tale of the alchemist Forneus and his quest to raise the dead and create life. Before we press onward, I'd like to discuss the high degree of subtlety that has been placed in the naming choices of these various characters, and the symbolic meanings behind each chosen name, and how it helps strengthen and reinforce the lore. Let's start with Forneus. Forneus is a name taken from occult books published in the early 1900s, referring to a specific demon that takes the form of a sea serpent and commands the armies of the underworld. This is certainly a specific choice, and was likely intentional. As not only is Forneus in-game referred to as the Demon Alchemist, he is implied to have created the First Risen, zombified soldiers wearing masks. This could also be seen as parallels to the armies that his namesake commanded in demonology. And when you consider Grima's own serpentine design, as are the common depictions of sea monsters, things only get more interesting. Beyond that is the entomology of Thebes itself. Thebes is a corruption of Thebes, an Egyptian city known for its necropolis on the west bank of the Nile, a vast series of tombs for the social elite. What's interesting about this name choice is the connection to Egypt, as popular culture depicts ancient Egypt as strange, otherworldly, and full of ancient tombs and curses. Look no further than Indiana Jones and the Brendan Fraser Mummy trilogy for reference. It is likely that this was a thematic choice considering the labyrinth's nature and presentation within Echoes. Moving back to in-game information, as we read the inscribed tablets within the labyrinth, we slowly piece together that everyone who enters Forneus' workshop is killed and likely raised from the dead soon after. And even when the mysterious council sealed Forneus below the sand, it's all too likely that his work continued. After beating the Brethren and the Fire Dragon on Floor 5, we break the seal and enter Floor 6. And from the records down here, we switch speakers to that of Forneus, and from the records he kept, we learn of his work 
and the process he used to create the Risen. The critical component in the Death Mask is a particular shelled insect. I have called these marvels of nature Thanatophages. When placed on a cadaver, Thanatophages set down and assert control. These notes describing Thanatophages divulge the nature of the Risen. Previous Fire Emblem zombies are animated using dark magic, such as the Revenants and Sacred Stones and those who also appear in Echoes. But the Risen set themselves apart by introducing a more organic element. It is then also notable that the mention continues the comparisons to Egypt, involving death masks and the description of Thanatophages can vaguely be related to scarab beetles, something also closely related to common media portrayals of ancient Egypt and its tombs. Beyond that, in terms of linguistics, Thanatos is the Greek god of death, separate from Hades who is the lord of the underworld. And as we can see, his name has been incorporated into the entomology of these mysterious insects. Thanatophages also refer to the condition known as the death drive, in which someone pursues their own suffering and death. Forneas' notes then take an interesting turn as we learned of his second pursuit, the creation of life. At last, blood from a divine dragon. Its power is terrifying, beautiful, even. The Senate has granted me all I need to craft life anew. I've succeeded. At first, it was a tiny thing. And on day 80, I gave it my blood. It grew. Its voice echoes in my head. Dark thoughts. Violent thoughts. These passages break the case wide open. And there's quite a bit here to go through. So let's do this piece by piece. Firstly, the mention of blood from a divine dragon. It is clear that this was the critical ingredient in whatever Forneas was doing, a fact confirmed by the second inscription. This tells us how he obtained the divine dragon blood. And across the next two inscriptions, Forneas describes some kind of being, and recounts its rapid growth in the presence of his own blood. The last inscription is what ends the tale, and implies heavily that Forneas became some kind of host for his creation. And with human blood within the creature, we see the beginnings of what is likely the fell bloodline, appearing in Awakening. This is the last we'll see of Grima until the seal is broken in Shadows of Valentia, releasing the creation of a madman out onto the world. It is likely during this time that Grima continues to build up his influence by creating a cult known as the Grimleal, and possibly taking the form of a human to spread his bloodline into a host as a contingency plan should he be destroyed. He is of course eventually destroyed by a descendant of Marth and the founder of the kingdom Ulysse, and Grima, once again, begins to bide his time. It is obvious by now that Grima is playing the long game. He has a devoted following and an entire bloodline's worth of host to inhabit once he regains his strength. And when he does, we see in the future in the world that Lucina inhabits is under constant siege. Grima, having learned his lesson, has elected to target Mirth's bloodline and the Falchion directly. Grima is smart and learns from his missteps, even going so far as to send a version of himself back in time to act as a safeguard should that same host resist him in the past. He accounts for every variable, and predicts every move the heroes will make, especially since he was at one point among the heroes himself. What's interesting is that Grima shares his name with another fictional character, being Grima Wormtongue from Lord of the Rings. It is likely, along with Phrynaeus, that this was a conscious choice. In Lord of the Rings, Grima Wormtongue is portrayed as a plodding, black-robed assistant to a powerful sorcerer. Sound familiar? And it goes deeper. As the former advisor to the King of Rohan, Grima predicts perfectly both the move to Helm's Deep and the notes the tactical weakness of the storm drain on the Deeping Wall. Just as Awakening's Grima created a seemingly foolproof plan, these deliberate similarities lead me to think that at some point a lot more was planned with Awakening's story and its symbolic images. What they've done with Echoes now has portrayed Grima as an intelligent and patient foe, a trait his host seems to mirror exactly. And just as Grima's intelligence have brought him his return, he missed out on one single variable, himself. Grima brought down by his own former host was something that never crossed his mind and was the one variable he didn't account for. In a sense, I guess this makes Grima one of the most intimidating and intelligent villains put in any Fire Emblem game, and the lore from Thebes puts him up there with Idun in my eyes. 
It's a shame that this lore had to wait until Echoes before it saw the light of day, because it alone makes the story of Awakening feel far more grand and nuanced, and playing it with this lore in mind helps to absolve many problems with Awakening's third act and the missing plot threads that seem within it. It makes Grima's minimal presence within the story feel deliberate, and it makes the Risen compelling. And it even makes that dumb Act 3 plot twist much more tolerable. Again, I'm sad Awakening couldn't include this, but the story of Phineas and Thabes is the kind of dark, subtle storytelling present in Fire Emblem 4, Sacred Stones, and even games like Bloodborne and Dark Souls. I'm very glad this lore found a way to get into the game, because if there was ever an Awakening HD, including this bit of lore in the opening cutscene would be all you would need for me to welcome back Awakening with open arms and embrace it once more as a true piece of the Fire Emblem series yet again. Anyways, I have been Zerk Monster Hunter 4. Thank you for watching, and as always, no matter what games you like to play, what kind of storytelling tropes you like to enjoy, happy hunting.